Hi, everyone. Welcome back. And um, uh, just take a seat as soon as you possibly can. Um, my name is Preeti Balchandani. I am a faculty member here at Timmy. And um, today it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Russell Poldrak, um, who is um, the Albert Ray Lang Professor in the, in the Department of Psychology and Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University, um, which is uh, where I did my grad school. So it's nice to have um, friends from there here. Um, he's the director of the St uh, Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience. Uh, his research uses neuroimaging to understand the brain systems underlying decision making and executive function, and his lab is also engaged in the development of neuroinformatic tools to help improve the reproducibility and transparency of neuroscience, um, which is a, a, a great goal. Um, and uh, they have uh, two um, resources, openfmri.org and neurovault.org, uh, which are data sharing projects um, and a cognitive atlas ontology. Um, so today, Dr. Poldrak is going to talk about the dynamics of human brain function. And uh, we thank him very much for coming to visit us. All right, cool, thanks. So um, I wanna talk about how brains change over time. And um, we actually know in some ways a lot about how brains change over time. We know that you know when you go to process a stimulus, there's a cascade of activity across the brain that takes some number of hundreds of milliseconds. We've learned about this through techniques like in humans, like MEG and EEG. On the other hand, we know a lot about how brains change over very long periods of time. We know how the brain changes over the course of child development how it changes as we age um, over the course of years and decades. But a few years ago, we started thinking about this kind of interesting missing bit between there. How do brains change over the course of days and weeks and months? And you might ask, you know, why, why is that interesting? So here's, here's one reason that's interesting. We think it's really important for understanding probably every neuropsychiatric disorder. Um, these are data from two individual schizophrenic patients. And uh, they're basically measurements on a, on a basically a scale of how well the person's functioning. If they're in the red zone, that means they're basically completely disabled. They can't even function on like their psychiatric ward. Whereas if they're in the green, they're doing pretty well. They can actually kind of get by day to day, interact with people and so on. And what you see is that over the course of sometimes a couple of weeks, someone can go from being completely disabled to basically completely functional and then back, right? So these huge fluctuations in something that must reflect brain function um, that we have no way of understanding because uh, basically neuroscientists have assumed that outside of, you know, sort of plasticity, things we learn, or, um, you know, kind of development or aging, that, that human brain function is stable. So if I scan a person, I'm getting a stable measure of kind of how their brain works. Um, that's an assumption, and until recently, we didn't really even have any data to test it. Um, but I think you know, many of us have come to think that if we want to understand, we want to kind of sort of provide the kind of models of individual brain function that precision neuroscience is going to require, we need to understand kind of where this variability and where the dynamics of brain function are coming from. Um, so why don't we know more about this? Well, in part because it's hard, right? So, um, so you know, if you think about like what are all the ways in which data could grow for, for human neuroscience, um, one is the data sets could become wide in the sense of scanning more individuals, recruiting larger samples. And certainly, this has been a, a major area of focus for studies like, you know, the UK Biobank, which wants to image 100,000 individuals, ABCD study, which wants to uh, image 10,000 kids longitudinally. Um, and so that's great because it'll improve a lot of the problems with statistical power that many of us have been talking about for a while. But there's other uh, dimensions as well. One is we'd like to have them imaged on lots of different things. And one, actually one of the trade-offs you have to make in these big studies is, you know, you image a bunch of people, but you're actually imaging each one on relatively few uh, particular phenotypes. I'm not gonna, we're really interested in that as well. I'm not gonna focus on that today. Um, you'd also hope that we could get dense imaging where each individual is being imaged, you know, over, uh, many different sessions so we can start to characterize variability over time. And that's something that basically has been done 
until the last few years basically hadn't been done at all and still has been done sort of very minimally. Um, and in part because it's really hard. If you imagine, I mean, it's hard enough to get people to come in, say, twice for a scan. Imagine trying to get the same person to come in once a week for a year to, if you want to really understand, you know, sort of uh, variability over time. That's logistically challenging and also expensive. And, and, you know, you can't write a grant proposal to get the money unless you can show that you have a proof of concept that you can actually do it. So we started thinking, you know, how can we get a proof of concept? And um, in, it landed on self-experimentation. You know, many of you may know that there's a checkered history of self-experimentation in medicine, right? People have done pretty outlandish things and sometimes died, um, but you know, people have also done things that have led to, uh, to amazing insights. So you know, in psychology, Ehrman Ebbinghaus basically established a lot of the laws of what we know about learning and memory by doing studies on himself. And you may be familiar with uh, Barry Marshall, who won a Nobel Prize for establishing that the bacterium H. pylori causes peptic ulcers in part by infecting himself, showing that he got an ulcer, and then taking about the antibiotic and showing that it cleared the ulcer. Um, so I was starting to think about this, actually in, in part inspired by an artist friend of mine who was really into the quantified self movement, um, who was saying, you know, you've got a scanner down in your basement, why aren't you getting in the scanner and scanning yourself? And this paper came out in 2012 um, by Mike Snyder and colleagues, um, who's a geneticist at Stanford, which sort of provided uh, an impetus to think that we could really do this. This was published in Cell, um, they did what they call integrated personal omics profiling, where basically, you know, he collected blood from himself over the course of about a year and a half, usually maybe once a month, but when he got sick, he would do it uh, much more frequently. And then his lab does, you know, all manner of omics, and so they basically did everything they know how to do on his blood. And it turned out that something really interesting happened uh, during the study, which is that during his, um, in, the, in the wake of his second respiratory infection, he developed type 2 diabetes. That's his blood sugar up on top, shows it spiking, and this is his uh, C-reactive protein in the bottom. And so it, it basically let them establish this really interesting relationship between sort of his immune system function and the, de the development of diabetes. And so seeing this paper in Cell made me think, hey, look, we can, you know, maybe we can actually do this. We can uh, use data from one person, um, in particular me, uh, getting in a scanner uh, repeatedly to try to actually understand something about how brains change over time. So. We developed what we call the My Connectome Project. Um, one of my colleagues, Steve Peterson, wanted to call it the Poldrome, but I didn't like that. It seemed too narcissistic. So, um, so basically, the idea is we collected a bunch of, we collected everything that I could tolerate collecting on myself for about a year and a half, which involved a bunch of different aspects of MRI. I'm going to focus on resting MRI today. Um, a bunch of different behavioral, lifestyle, sleep measurements. Collected blood once a week and did RNA seq um, on that, and I'm not going to talk about that today. But um, basically, did pretty much you know everything a human can tolerate. Um, I'm going to focus today on one particular type of measure, which is resting fMRI. Um, so yeah, many of you may be familiar with the resting fMRI. The idea is you just put somebody in a scanner instead of having them actually do things like we traditionally have in fMRI. You just have them sit there and quote unquote do nothing. Um, and you know, hopefully they're not falling asleep, and actually that's a big problem, but if they're not falling asleep, they're still not doing nothing, right? They're just engaging in kind of, you know, self-directed thought, kind of thinking about what we think about when we're not being told by a psychologist to do something. Um, and so it turns out that when you have people do that, just sit in a scanner and do nothing, um, different parts of the brain fluctuate in concert with one another, and if you apply matrix factorization tools like independent component analysis to the data, um, what you can see is that there's sets of regions that move together, um, and these have come to be called resting state networks. These are seen, this is uh, from uh, Mark Rakel's paper on the right, showing a number of different networks that have been identified, and depending on who you ask, there's some number between, say, 8 and 17 of them. But they all have sort of functional descriptions, right, in the sense that we think that some of them are, you know, involved regions that are involved in, say, executive control, others involved in vision or audition and so on. Um, the thing that really uh, sort of captured my interest in resting state fMRI was this paper in 2009 by Steve Smith and colleagues where they basically did, you know, they did these analyses on resting state fMRI using independent component analysis and then took a very different type of data set, which is this thing called the brain map database, which has activation coordinates from task fMRI studies where you tell people to, you know, do things in a scanner and then look at what turns on. Apply the same tool to those data and you see you actually get back pretty much the same networks, not, not identical, but very close set of networks across the two, suggesting that you know, having people sit in the scanner and do nothing and then sort of decomposing the data gives you back the same sort of structure that you would get by actually having them do tasks. Now, we now know that that's not a perfect uh, uh, relationship, but it's, but it's actually pretty good. 
So we wanted to dive deeper into resting fMRI. So um, we wanted to ask first, you know, is it stable over time? Um, and, uh, and, you know, is there sort of common network structure between people um, when, you, when you look at each individual sort of in detail? Um, and so um, I got into a scanner a total of now 107 times over, uh, over the core, 104 of those over the, the, the initial study for a year and a half. This was actually on a follow-up. I had to fly to Wash U and get in a scanner for about six hours in one day to address a reviewer comment on a paper. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's Tim Lauman, who was a grad student at Steve Peterson's lab, who did a ton of the work that you're going to see today in terms of the, the uh, analytic uh, stuff. This is a timeline of the measurements. Each tick here is one measurement for each of these different things. So you see from October 2012 to February 2014, um, I did, uh, where's resting, 84 usable resting fMRI scans. I uh, actually got in the scanner 104 times over, that, uh, over the course of that time, but some, we, we ended up throwing out some of the data for various reasons. But you can see I did a lot of other things here too that I'm not gonna have much time to talk about today. Um, so we've already heard a lot about sort of open data um, for both Adam and, and from Jan about open code. Um, we've been real proponents of both open data and open code for a long time. And um, one of the things that I set out to do was basically give away all my data to free. So except for, for to, you know, out in the open. So except for my diary entries, which are a little too private, um, basically all the data that we collected, including all of my genomics data, all my imaging data are available openly online. You can just go download them. There's so far uh, 13 papers really published are on one of the archives that have used these data sets for lots of different things. Um, and you know, feel free to go, uh, to go grab them. It's one of the, I think, the best characterized large imaging data sets on an individual that's out there. There's one other data set that's sort of similar that I'll mention. So the first question that we ask is, you know, can we identify the functional organization of the cortex using resting fMRI and how stable is it or how variable is it? So one of the things we do is uh, use a technique that was developed by Steve Peterson's group at Wash U, um, where we basically do a parcellation of the surface of the cortex. So we, here we're going to, you know, obviously subcortical regions are very interesting, but here we're going to mostly focus on, on cortical areas. So the idea is you take every, you put the data, kind of project the data onto a reconstructed surface of the cortex, and then at every spot on that surface, you look at its pattern of correlation with all the other spots, and you sort of cluster voxels or cluster vertices on the surface based on their connectivity patterns. And when you do that, what you see is you get sort of relatively small regions that have sort of homogeneous connectivity patterns, probably in the order of, you know, a centimeter or two, something like that. And this shows kind of a, the, the pipeline of that, uh, that analysis. This is what the, the ultimate uh, results look like. In my data, we get 616 regions that pop out. Um, and so each of these, the, the gray lines here are kind of the boundaries between those regions. So each of these little spots, like that guy right there, that guy right there, that's one of these cortical regions. So that's sort of like, you know, one level of organization. And then we can cluster those in, and try to find these larger scale, you know, sort of networks that I talked about earlier. Um, and that's what you see in color here. Um, we use a parcellation that Peterson's group has developed that includes 13 of these networks. And we see that those pop out in my data. I'm not gonna have time to go into it, but one of the really interesting things that came out of this was that there were some spots in my data that were kind of in, not in places that we would have expected based on uh, the, what we knew from group data. And that's now since been replicated in others, um, particularly by a Nico Dosenbach's group at WashU. So it turns out that most people actually have a weird little salience network spot in the, in the middle of their default mode in the prefrontal cortex. We never knew about that until we started scanning people a lot and be able to be able to make these kind of maps because they're all in different places in different people. Um, now one question is, you know, how, uh, how consistent are these parcellations? So this is actually the reason that Steve's group first got in touch with me and they heard I was doing the study and they wanted to have this amount of data to test how reliable their parcellation tools were. So one thing that we do is we just randomly split the data into two halves, run the parcellation on each half and ask, you know, how consistent is it? And it turns out that it's very consistent across those two data sets, suggesting that these little spots we're finding really are sort of functionally coherent uh, regions of the cortex. Now you might also ask, do they mean anything functionally? Um, and so we, alongside the resting data, we did a bunch of different task uh, functional MRI data sets. And it turns out that the task fMRI data, um, 
sort of systematically map onto these uh, sort of functional regions that were identified by resting fMRI. Uh, this, I think, is a compelling one. We do retinotopic mapping, where we show me, like, you know, rotating wedges and expanding rings and things like that to map out V1, V2, you know, the areas in the visual cortex. Um, and then, so the, the black lines here show the boundaries of resting state uh, parcels that were identified just on the basis of resting state correlation. The colors are based on a separate set of scans that did retinotopic mapping. And what you can see is that there's a really nice sort of alignment of the boundaries of the retinotopic maps, not perfect, but pretty close, um, and those uh, resting state uh, connectivity-based functional parcellations. Suggests that it really is identifying kind of you know, functionally important distinctions in the cortex. So then we wanted to ask, how variable is this over time? And um, so what I'm showing you here is uh, basically we, we took the, the correlation matrix between each of those 600 regions, and then we asked how variable is that correlation matrix over time. So this is a map of the variability of that correlation matrix. So I'm what I'm showing here is the standard deviation. Um, you can see it in general it's pretty low. There's pretty low variability from, from day to day. Um, and, um, but some regions show more than others. And in particular, what we see is that the most variable regions, and we can actually see this on the, on the surface of the cortex, the regions whose, whose connectivity varies the most from, uh, from day to day are these kind of relatively early regions, visual regions and somatomotor regions. Um, so then the question is, how does that relate to uh, variability across people, right? If, if it turns out that variability within me looks just like variability across people, then that might tell us we don't need to scan individuals a bunch. We can just scan a bunch of people. It turns out to, to look very different, right? This is the pattern of variability across, I think, 120 people from, uh, from the Peterson group using not exactly the same parcellation, but a, a kind of a, a lower resolution parcellation. Um, and what you see is that the regions that showed the greatest variability in my data actually show some of the lowest variability across individuals. And the regions that show high variability across individuals actually show fairly low variability in my data set. So it suggests that, um, that you know, the, the patterns of intra-individual variability and inter-individual variability are very different. Um, and so that kind of answers our proof of concept question. You know, we really do need to study individuals densely if we want to understand sort of, you know, how variability looks within a person. So then we wanted to ask, what might drive some of these differences? Um, and there was an interesting kind of built-in experiment that we did. So I mentioned that um, I did blood draw. So every, so basically I, these, these scans were taken every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 7.30 a.m. because I wanted a control time of day. Um, and on Tuesdays, immediately after the scan, I'd walk over to the the um, health center and have blood drawn for, for the RNA-seq analyses. Um, but for, the, for those analyses, I needed to be fasted and uncaffeinated. Um, whereas on Thursdays, I show up and I had had breakfast and coffee. So we had a built-in experiment where we can compare Tuesday morning and Thursday morning to ask, you know, are there effects of caffeine and or food? We can't pull those apart because they're perfectly confounded. But are there, do they affect connectivity? And um, this is the connectivity, just the, the, coral, the average correlation matrix for Tuesdays, and this is the one for Thursdays. And sort of by eye, they look pretty similar, right? That there's a lot of, you know, within each of these networks, there's pretty high correlation, and they're pretty anti-correlated uh, between them, or at least uncorrelated. But if you look at the comparison, you see that, again, there's um, some regions popping out and some networks popping out that seem to show higher variability. And again, it's in the visual network, uh, which is that one, and the somatomotor network, and the, con the connections between them. Now, one thing we can do is to kind of further investigate how this is affecting network structure is to project the data into a two-dimensional space. So what we do is we compute the connectivity matrix, we threshold it to create a graph, and then we project the graph into a two-dimensional space. Um, and so each dot here is one of those 620 regions. Um, and I've colored them in terms of, or I've kind of labeled here in terms of some of the main resting state networks. Um, and if you just kind of eyeball Tuesday versus Thursday, you can see that many of these main networks, like default mode, frontal parietal, single opercular, um, have a kind of a similar relationship to one another, maybe a little more tightly integrated on Thursdays compared to Tuesdays, but they don't really change their relationship that much. But what's really striking is, 
Um, on Tuesdays when I'm fed and, or, sorry, when I'm fasted and uncaffeinated, the visual and somatosensory networks are much more closely integrated with one another. So here they're kind of, you know, close to each other and they're much more connected. Um, this is denoting that there are hubs, which basically means these are individual nodes that are highly connected to other nodes. Whereas on Thursdays, you see that those two networks become basically disconnected from one another. So it's not just slight changes in, you know, in sort of how things are connected. It's really a broad scale reorganization of the network. And what's interesting is I would have thought that, you know, maybe when I'm uncaffeinated, everything would just sort of get worse uh, or get less connected and become more noisy. But that's not the case. You actually get higher connectivity between these very early systems on those days when I'm, caffeine when I'm uncaffeinated and, and we know from questionnaires that I'll talk about in a bit that I'm actually, you know, more tired and, and less aroused on those days. Um, so, so that suggests that there are you know, really interesting dri potential drivers of changes in connectivity that don't necessarily work in the way we might have expected. So then we wanted to ask, do things change over a longer period of time? Um, and um, the first way that we looked at this is j basically just by clustering connectivity patterns. So Max Schein, who was a postdoc in the lab, took the data. Within each of the 84 sessions, he took the kind of average connectivity matrix, and then he just clustered those over time using a technique called affinity propagation, and came up with two what he calls meta states. And the idea is that these are kind of clusters of connectivity patterns that occur over time. Um, so this is the connectivity between sessions that's ordered by sessions. This is the same data ordered by those two meta states. You see this one labeled in red, we call meta state one, the, this one labeled in blue, we call metastate two. And this is the timeline showing that, you know, the, the, the metastate two stuff happened more earlier in the study compared to late, but still continued to appear throughout the study. Um, and so then the question is, you know, what's going on in those two different metastates? Um, and so Mac addressed this by um, using a questionnaire that I took. So every time I got out of the scanner, I would do a, a questionnaire, I think it is 60 items, called the, or more than 60, maybe 80 items, called the positive and negative affect scale, where you basically, for a bunch of questions, say, how drowsy were you today? How sleepy were you today? How attentive were you today? How concentrating were you today? Um, and it turns out that that first meta state is correlated with high responses on questions about being sleepy or drowsy or sluggish or tired. The second meta state is correlated with questions about being attentive and concentrating and lively, right? So it really is sort of reflecting some sort of difference in arousal states between those two days. Now it wasn't, it was somewhat related to caffeine food, it actually wasn't significantly correlated with the caffeine food effect, but uh, probably share some overlap. Um, and then these are the two network projections uh, using the same approach that I showed a moment ago. And again, you see in metastate one, these are the visual and somatomotor regions that are kind of, again, closely clustered. And um, these are those same two networks on the days when I'm not tired, again, sort of split apart and less connected. So similar story of sort of on those, those days when I'm in the state, the connectivity state where I'm tired, we get this integration of visual and somatos somatosensory and motor networks that we don't really have a way to understand yet. So, um, okay, so this basically shows that, you know, with enough data, resting state connectivity is an incredibly stable measure, but also shows variability over time that we think we can explain primarily in terms of, uh, of arousal states. There's probably other drivers as well, um, but, uh, but that's the, the ones that have really popped out. So then the question is, what about things happening on an even shorter time scale? So this is looking at, you know, kind of days, weeks, months. <clears throat> what about uh, seconds and minutes, right? And um, so we then basically have started both using my data and um, other open data sets like the Human Connectome Project to start to ask this question of how the brain fluctuates at a shorter period of time and then whether we can relate that back to sort of longer range dynamics. And we're gonna focus on a particular aspect of brain function that's really kind of one of the oldest questions in neuroscience, which is to what degree is the brain sort of functionally integrated versus segregated? So, you know, historically people like Gall sort of argued that the brain is, you know, made up of a bunch of modules and each of them does a particular computation. Um, whereas people like Lashley argued, oh, the brain is one big sort of, you know, equipotential computational organ. Now, um, we now know, you know, modern network science gives us the ability to actually understand that Complex networks like brains and many other networks in the world actually have a really interesting mixture of both integration and segregation. That's kind of a hallmark 
of, of complex networks. That they show modular structure in the sense that you have sort of you know sets of elements that are tightly connected with one another, but those also show uh, you know sort of integrated uh, connectivity across the the nodes as well, um, and and. And actually, that, that the network science gives us the computational tools to actually describe both integration and segregation. So the way that we describe segregation is basically by asking how connected is any particular node to other nodes within its uh, within its kind of network modules. So if you think of those like the the resting state networks I talked about as modules, then we can say you know for example, if you're in the default mode network here. Uh, you know, and these guys are in, I think that's the frontal parietal network, you know, this particular uh, node has relatively low module degree, meaning that it's not really very connected to other nodes in its network, whereas this one has a high module degree because it's connected to several other nodes within the same network. So that tells us basically how, how much segregation there is. Um, and then we can also measure integration by basically looking at the, co the connections between those networks. So something like participa participation coefficient tells us, for example, you know, this particular node has low participation because it's really only connected to other nodes within its network, whereas um, this one here has high participation because it's connected both to, you know, other yellow nodes and to other red nodes. In fact, half of its connections, I think, to other red nodes. So, so we can quantify at the same time both, you know, for any particular node, how integrated is it within its module and how, um, integrated is it with the rest of the brain. Now in network science people often use what's called a cartographic analysis where they um, will basically you know, compute those two numbers and then say where do you fall in this particular uh, frame and ask you know, are you a hub versus a node, hubs being sort of more highly connected and then what kind of hub are you. We were sort of unsatisfied with that kind of you know, qualitative uh, distinction so what we do in general is create what we call a cartographic profile. And so what this is, is a, um, it's just a joint histogram where you know, each entry is, uh, is one of those 620 or however many um, nodes we have in the network. And we just build up a histogram of the participation coefficient versus the, the module degree z-score. And so it gives us a characterization of kind of where the network sits in terms of its overall integration. Um, and we're particularly interested in how this kind of integration changes over time. Um, we, you know, we've known for a long time that brains are in general pretty integrated as, in terms of a network, but um, work in the last few years has started to suggest that this integration can fluctuate over time. Um, and the way that we generally do this is using some sort of sliding window to compute correlation on a relatively small amount of the data and then sort of move that across the data. This is a movie, um, this is from work from Max Schein, showing that cartographic profile for these sort of moving windows over time on the Human Connectome Project data. Um, and what you see is that, you know, for the most part, the brain sits in that relatively integrated state, but occasionally it pops back to the left into a much more segregated state. Um, and, uh, and we see these changes over the course of tens of seconds. Um, and so there's another, another example of that. Um, and it turns out that if you look over time within an individual, you see that they will fluctuate between being in sort of this more integrated state, which looks like this, you know, where the participation coefficient on average is pretty high, to a more segregated state where you still have a few regions here that have higher participation, but a lot of them have basically dropped back down such that, you know, most of the communication is now within modules as opposed to between modules. Um, and, um, then the question is, what is, how does that relate to cognition, right? Um, it's interesting that it's there in resting state data. But we, you know, we know, one thing we know about resting state data is that there's a lot of potential drivers of artifacts, things like head motion and breathing that can drive changes that may not be sort of, you know, relevant to cognition or neural function directly. So one thing that we did was to take all the task data from the Human Connectome Project and ask, um, basically, how does integration change as a function of task? This is a, a, we can do statistics on those cartographic profiles, right? This is a, a, a difference map on the cartographic profile where regions in red show basically more integration for, uh, or sort of more signal there for task, and blue show more signal there for rest. This is basically showing that the cloud has kind of moved to the right into the direction of integration when one does a task. And if we look across all the different tasks, we just basically quantify how far does that, uh, does that profile move to the right? 
you can see that you know basically for more difficult tasks in general, it moves sort of farther to the right, especially for this in back, which is a, a task that involves you to kind of hold on to information in mind and then update it in an ongoing manner. We can also ask uh, how it relates to um, trial by trial performance. Um, and this is an ongoing analysis from Patrick Bissett in the lab where he, he looked at basically in the human connected project uh, working memory data, what happens right before somebody makes an error versus right before they get it right. Um, and it turns out that you're more likely to be in that, uh, that kind of less integrated state, in the more segregated state, when you make an error, suggesting that it is, it's, it, you know, it's important. Integration is important for performance, at least on these kinds of complex cognitive tasks. Okay, so now we have the, the tools to allow us to try to relate those long-term and short-term dynamics. Um, and the first thing we can do is just, with the MyConnectome data, compare those two metastates that we saw to ask, how does integration differ between them? Um, and so this is basically telling you that metastate two had higher integration, that metastate two is the one where I was sort of awake, right? Um, compared to metastate one, which has lower integration, um, consistent with the idea that, you know, when you're in a more, sort of a more pro-cognitive state, you're gonna have uh, higher integration. Then what we can do is ask, um, you know, is, is there some way to sort of look at, to sort of, you know, integrate these two questions? And one of the things that people in the literature have started asking about is what we call flexibility. That is, the degree to which individual nodes in the network actually change their network assignments. Um, and um, what we see is if we compare those two metastates, we see that as you, um, you know, as you go over time, in metastate two, in the one where, you know, where I'm more uh, awake, um, individual network nodes are actually more likely to change their network assignment, to kind of flip between networks um, over time. And, uh, and that's particularly in the visual and somatomotor regions. So this says that not only is that variability in those regions you know, higher from day to day, um, but it's also higher within a session in terms of those networks actually popping back and forth. Um, and we compared the data from uh, from my data set to this other data set from, uh, from Johns Hopkins, which was released right around the same time, another open data set. Someone actually scanned uh, longer than I was. Um, and we see similarly, they show this, this altered flexibility. We don't have, um, we don't have uh, arousal data on that person, but we can see that within sessions, those are the networks that show the greatest uh, changes in, uh, in flexibility over time. So, um, so what might be driving this? Well, one of the obvious candidates are kind of ascending, uh, you know, neuromodulatory arousal systems. Um, one of the, the prime candidates being the neuroendergic system. So we know that, uh, you know, the neuroendergic system drives kind of, you know, large scale changes in neuronal dynamics from work, particularly by people like uh, David McCormick. Um, and we also know that you can, um, at least as a proxy, use um, pupil diameter as a way to index these arousal systems. Now, it's, it's important to point out, we're not, it's not a measure of the neuroenergic system, it's almost certainly reflecting the cholinergic system as well, and that's clear from, you know, from this work by, by Reimer and colleagues. Um, nonetheless, we can use it as some sort of proxy for arousal, and so, um, so Mac got his hands on a, a data set, um, I, I should, uh, an aside about open data, so Mac Schein was a postdoc with me for two years, got a number of papers, never collected one bit of data in his life. All of his work was done on open shared data. So I think it's really a testament to, to the power of those data. Um, this was a data set someone shared with us, um, where, which included both um, pupilometry data and resting state fMRI. And you see that basically higher, um, if, you, if you look at the correlation between pupil diameter and um, these changes in state, basically you see larger pupil diameter is associated with higher integration, suggesting that this might be a candidate mechanism. And in, uh, you know, in the, the neurobiology literature, there's been ideas for a long time that one of the effects of noradrenaline on, you know, sort of cortical neurons is to sort of change the, their, their gain, to basically turn up their sensitivity to inputs. Um, and this is, comes from, you know, earlier work by, um, by Whitehouse and colleagues and also from Gary Aston Jones. And then is sort of recently an argument made by Eldar, Niv, and Cohen um, in a Nature Neuroscience paper, suggesting that basically, you know, noradrenaline pushes one into a kind of a higher SNR, higher gain sort of uh, situation. So we wanted to ask, you know, for me, just thinking about, you know, what's happening at the level of single neurons, it's really hard to relate that to something super high level like network integration. 
And so we wanted to ask if we could use some kind of neural modeling approach to, um, to understand how is it that turning knobs like gain could actually affect things like you know, global network integration. So we used an approach that's been developed by um, Randy McIntosh and Victor Yersa and others um, and implemented in this project that they've developed called the Virtual Brain, which basically al allows us to um, build a simulated brain network where each of the nodes in the network is a relatively simple oscillator um, that is meant to be a really rudimentary model of a population of neurons that gets input, you know, has output, also has intrinsic noise. We basically build a brain using a bunch of those oscillators that are wired together using, in this case, a macaque uh, connectivity matrix because we trust the macaque connectivity based on track tracing probably better than we would uh, diffusion imaging in humans. Um, so you wire up this basically little simulated macaque brain um, and then you just turn it on and let it run and so you get back neural time series and then you can turn those into simulated bold data um, using a balloon Winkessel model. Then we can do all the analyses that we've been doing on the bold data on those data um, and get our cartographic analysis and so on. And we wanted to ask about two particular effects. One is what happens when we turn up the gain, basically the, the steepness of the input to activity function for each of those oscillators. And this is just, these are just global changes for all of the, the nodes in the, the network. And the other is just what happens when we turn up excitability, when basically, you know, how much output is caused by a particular amount of input. And, um, and this is what we see. So the left just basically shows how synchronous activity is across the entire brain. And the point here is that, you know, when gain and or uh, excitability are low, basically the brain is pretty much functionally disconnected, right? Nothing is really very synchronous with anything else. Um, and then as you turn up both of those, there's a particular place that you hit where suddenly everything becomes highly synchronous. Basically, you go into epilepsy, right? So there's a really fine line here between sort of order and between, like, you know, sort of un an unreasonable amount of order and disorder. Um, and, um, and that's really this, what we call the critical boundary. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a developing line of work about the importance of criticality in dynamical systems and the idea that, you know, that sort of many dynamical systems like the brain probably operate at this kind of critical boundary between order and disorder. Um, and in fact, what we see is that if we look at participation coefficient, sort of how, you know, how integrated the brain is, we see that around this, uh, cr this transition, um, we see this rapid rise in, um, in, sort of integration across the brain, um, telling us that these kind of changes in gain are a, a plausible way to get kind of large scale changes in, um, in things like network integration. Obviously there's a ton more to be done here with more realistic models and so on. Um, but nonetheless, it provides at least some kind of, you know, computational background for the ideas of, of neural gain modulation. Okay, so just to summarize overall, um, you know, these data suggest that there's dynamics at a number of different time scales that are sort of linked to one another in interesting ways that cognitive neuroscience has basically just completely failed to even look at um, until the last couple of years. Um, and in order to get at this, we really need a lot more data from individuals studied intensely over time with as much sort of other phenotypic metadata as we can get. Um, and we think that the ascending neuromodulatory systems are a prime candidate for this. Now, I want to leave with, uh, with one question, which is um, how do we reconcile this? So, you know, the way that I've been talking about the brain, right, kind of treats it in the same way that, that a network scientist would treat a, you know, a, a network of airline hubs or power grids or any other types of things, right, where it doesn't really matter what each of the individual things is doing, right, it just matters how they're connected to one another and, you know, sort of how that changes the network dynamics. But, you know, you saw earlier from Jan's talk and we know from neurobiology that individual regions do different things, right? Different, different sets of layers in one of these convolutional neural nets is gonna be representing different types of information. And it's not as if it's just another way for the, you know, for the, the information to get from A to B, it's actually doing something to the information. So I think one of the, the real challenges for us and for cognitive neuroscience and, uh, and the neuroimaging world in general is to figure out how to reconcile these two very different ways of thinking about how brains work. Because clearly, you know, brain dynamics at the large scale network level are really interesting, um, but they don't tell us about computation yet. And we want to figure out how we can kind of bring those two worlds together.
Um, so finally, I just want to thank all the folks who've worked on this, particularly Max Shine, who's back in Sydney now, and plug my book, which is coming out in October. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, Dr. Poldrek. Um, we are going to take questions. And uh, please make sure to come up to the microphones on the two sides of the room with your questions. Thank you. Hi. Oh, yes. Is it on? It's on. Yeah. OK. Oh, yes, uh, Fernando. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, excellent presentation. So I was um, curious about uh, your uh, brain model towards the end. Uh, interaction between, say, uh, excitability versus gain. So some people have, you know, in the literature over the years, suggested that, uh, you know, some behavioral anomalies in the brain could be related to uh, uh, action potential. And for example, depression, some people have suggested that it, it could be uh, due to a, um, to um, a, Essentially, actual potential being pretty close to, uh, to, an, to an excitable level, and then over time you become refractory. Is that, is that some kind of behavior? And, and conversely, when you are um, um, some mild level of uh, being close to the threshold can also create like uh, ep episodes of many and things like this. Is that something that you actually uh, um, comes out of your models, uh, uh, at least at the theoretical level? I mean, I don't think it comes out of, I think these models are too rudimentary to give you that sort of you know interesting behavior, and I think actually that gets back to this thing I raised at the end, right? Mm -hmm. If we really want to understand something like depression, right, or even you know mm -hmm. something like any aspect of cognitive function, we need to be able to say something about the particular computations that are being done and how, because you know presumably there, and you know we want to be able to link specific changes to specific as aspects of cognition, not just to kind of. And, global changes, and that's, you know, this is really giving us back kind of a very global picture. Just basically just topographic changes as opposed to basically functional changes, is what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Thank, thank you for the uh, really, really interesting talk. I see a lot of interesting methods in, in, your, um, in, in your presentation. Um, the way that we've perceived the brain over the past hundred years or so has really changed in concert with the technology available to us as a society. So. We used to see the brain as, as a machine during the Industrial Revolution, and then we started to see the brain as a series of, of circuits with the explosion of computer science in the second half of the 20th century. And now in the Facebook era, we're starting to contextualize the brain as, as a network, you know, using graph theory and nodes and, and connections. What would you say is the limitation of, of this particular framework? And, and do you think that we will eventually move to, to a new and better one, or at least layer a new and better one on top of what we have now? I mean, in reality, I think this is, you know, the, the talk that you heard before me is the newer and better one, right? That as we, that we're basically going to start thinking of brains in terms of simplified versions of brains, right? Not in terms of thinking of them as a highway network or a telephone operator or a steam engine or whatever. I think you're exactly right that, you know, that we're, we, we, we get hamstrung by the metaphors. Um, and, um, and I think that you know, what we're now seeing from you know, work of people like Dan Yam is, is that one can do interesting analyses of you know, how, you know, what is it that convolutional neural nets are learning um, and relate that back to, to what brains actually do. Um, and I think that's actually going to be the next metaphor that can hopefully drive uh, you know, sort of interesting understanding. And the theory that is being developed around these, uh, these networks you know, can hopefully extend into interesting neural theory. I think, you know, you can also imagine that, you know, it's like there was a great paper by um, Conrad Kerting and, and um, one of his uh, trainees recently called, um, could a neuroscientist understand a microprocessor, right? Where they basically tried to say, if you took the strategies that we use on, um, on like, you know, figuring out how brains work and apply them to figuring out how a, you know, computer chip works, would it actually work? And they argued that it didn't. Um, I think that this is probably a better, you know, a better example is asking, you know, could a computer, could a neuroscientist understand a convolutional neural net, right? Could the, you know, would the strategies that we use give us back the structure that's in that network if we didn't actually know it, we just had the data like recordings from individual, you know, units within the network or something like that. I think there's a lot of ways in which this metaphor is going to be much more powerful. Thank you. 
And uh, we'll take one last question from right hand side. Hi. Um, I first uh, would like to thank you for providing this um, valuable uh, data. And I think this um, sort of data is going to help a lot advancing the field. And thank you so much for this heuristic action and uh, doing this. Uh, my question is about uh, your self-awareness when you're sitting inside the scanner or you're laying down inside the scanner. So um, I'll give you a quick example. You know if you move inside the scanner what will happen. You said like a bunch of the resting state data has been uh, uh, the discarded. First of all, I want to know why they were discarded. And the second thing, while you were sitting inside the scanner, what you were thinking of, right? These yep. are the... Um, Two questions. Okay. So um, most of the, the most of the discards were actually due to uh, the first after the first I think twelve sessions we changed the the imaging protocol so we treated those first twelve as a pilot I mean in addition I was I started out as a pretty anxious subject and I know that you know over the course of that first I guess that would have been a couple months you know that my anxiety was kind of ramping down and so by the time we get to the first real session in the data which is thirteen or fourteen. Um, I'm uh, much more relaxed in the scanner, um, and I'm not moving very much. Um, the, but the, the sessions that were rejected, I think were primarily rejected because of you know, too much motion, um, where certain days I would be a little fidgety. What was I thinking about? I tried to, I mean, it's funny, because you would imagine that, like, you know, I might have thought that um, you know, sitting in a scanner for 10 minutes every morning would come to be really kind of you know, a drag. It turned out to be just like a, I don't want to use the term meditative in like a meditation sense, but it just became a, a time when I could get in and just like, just, you know, kind of relax and just kind of let my mind go free and wander. Um, and, you know, in part try not to fall asleep, but, um, cause I did it with my eyes closed. Um, but, um, but it was, you know, I tried not to certainly sort of direct my own thoughts. And I think it was usually either kind of awareness of my own body or um, thinking about, you know, events of the day. Those were the two main sort of things. Thank you so much, and here is a present for you. you. <laughs> it says your name on it. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, your excellent talk. Sure, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you. Great way to cure.